So we're going to start again. End of the break, please, students. So. Okay, so now we have the pleasure to receive J. Christopher Proctor, which who's going to talk about heterodox economics and climate economy modeling. So without further ado, I give him the floor for his presentation and then we'll proceed in the typical way. So thank you, J. Christopher. Thank you, Rudy. Um, I'm good without the mic because I have those. Yep. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm J. Christopher Proctor. I met some of you in Compiègne last week. Uh, I'm an EPOG alumni, so just trying to do the math. 2014 to 2016, I was the second cohort that, that went through EPOG. Uh, so it's been a little bit of time, but not so long. Uh, yeah, and I'm back to talk about climate change. I've heard you guys talk a lot about climate change now. That was not, I, back in my year, I think we maybe had two seminars about climate change, maybe three. So things can change fast. Yeah, exactly. And apparently now it's, now I don't have to explain the basics but I will explain the basics. <laughs> so we're back, but I'll explain them quickly. Um, so net zero by 2050, uh, this was, wow, you've got some, some amazing light. Uh, the, the slides will look funny. All the very light colors disappear and I like light colors. Um, so net zero by 2050, uh, that's one of the outcomes of the 2018 global warming by 1.5 degrees report where they looked at lots and lots of model runs and they said, roughly, if we look at where most of them cross uh, the path to try to, where they cross net zero on their way to a 1.5 degree scenario, it's somewhere around 2050. So that should more or less be the target. Um, so I wanted to, to think a little bit about what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, energy is about 75% of emissions. We can fight about this, but it'd be nice if we didn't. Um, and so I'm mostly looking at the energy sector and, and some of the, the, energy, the emissions associated with energy use. Um, so there's this really great story that we probably are aware of that renewables have exploded in the last five, 10, 20 years. Uh, and while they have exploded, they've also gotten much, much cheaper. So the price of electricity, especially from solar energy has just absolutely dropped by almost 100% in the last 10 years. Um, and that's really cool. And that's, that's, that's good news. Uh, so in the United States, where I'm from, we now have 90 times more solar capacity than when I started studying economics back in 2010. Uh, so for the first 10 years from 2000 to 2010, we all, about doubled our capacity. And then from 2010 to 2020, there was a 90 times increase, which is, which is cool. It's really big. Um, and since I made those slides last year, I checked for the updated number and it's gone up another 30%. Um, so solar capacity is really, really going crazy in the United States, which is cool. Um, but a problem that we have with this is that this new energy, this new capacity added by renewable energies is being added to meet new demand. So we have the story of the development of, of uh, civilization, at least the last 20 or 200 or 300 years that we used to have traditional biomass. So we would burn wood uh, for, for our energy. Uh, and so we have the little line here. Then we discovered coal and how great coal is. And so we switched everything to coal, except we didn't switch. We just added coal on top of the traditional biomass. But the same amount of traditional biomass has stayed almost steady the whole time. Then we switched from coal to oil uh, in the oil age. But again, the coal never went away. It just added on top to, to fill more and more demand. And so that is more or less what's happening now with renewables, uh, where yes, they're exploding, but as demand is increasing, they are filling that extra demand and without necessarily replacing the other fossil fuels uh, that, that came before them. Um, yay, my lines work. Uh, so just to, to literally put it on a chart, what does 2050 by a uh, net zero by 2050 look like? Uh, it's having this little renewable and nuclear part here go down to there in that, about that space, um, which is, yeah, it's, it's ambitious. It's a big thing to do. Um, but of course, this flat line here is assuming the demand stays the way that it is. Um, but of course, that's not the plan. The plan is to have growth, um, at least the, the official plan. And, and so this gap here is something of what we're trying to fill with, with non-carbon emitting energies. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's a big task, and and I don't know, it's kind of useful for me at least to see it on a chart like this. Um, global solar needed, yeah. So go back to to the solar energy that that was going crazy in the charts. This is a, a chart from the IEA showing how much solar energy is needed uh, total in 2030 to be on track to, to reach 1.5 degrees, uh, and then the, the actual capacity for each of those years. Um, so something has to change. To, to get there, you have to have quite a huge peak. Uh, no, no, absolutely no. Not, well, uh, there's the same like GDP growth path. Um, not the same, but, but with positive growth. So this was from an IEA report. Um, and I think that they had some demand reducing measures, but it wasn't degrowth or anything, anything quite like that. Um, but yeah, so but that's sort of the, the the scale of the task that is officially being set out. Um, and then my last one that I like here is uh, is COVID. So here's the woo, global annual emissions globally. And so you can see the little dip where where COVID goes down, and then we we immediately pick back up. And so again, just sort of pushing that out to 2050, what does that look like? Um, it's something roughly the same slope as that COVID decline, but going all the way down uh, every year until 2050. Um, so a very long introduction, just to say that there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and if, if we want to actually do any of this, there's, yeah, a lot of things we're gonna have to figure out. Uh, and, and so that's where climate economy models come in. So how do we fill these giant gaps? How do we move these giant arrows? Um, we have options and, and we have these models that help us try to think about them. Uh, so very shortly, what is a climate economy model? Well, easy answer. It's any model that combines a climate module with an economy module. Um, so you've, I imagine, been studying a handful of different economic uh, models and what you can do is take the outputs of those models and link them to a climate model that will say, if you have these outputs given the certain economic parameters, what happens to the climate? Then you can feed back and say, given what's happening to the climate, how does that affect the economy? That is the very minimum core of a climate economy model. Um, but of course, then you can add on all kinds of other stuff. Energy is sort of the, the most obvious one that usually gets added on because it's such a big part of the story. Um, and, and so you can have these energy models that, that then loop in and can be very detailed and, and very big and, and quite exciting. Um, yeah, and, and that's kind of the game is adding more and more things onto these models. So you can model land use. How much land do we need for all these solar panels? How much water do we need for all the, the different materials that we're going to create? Um, what's the biodiversity impacts? Uh, and each time you're sort of building a box to try to model one of these problems and then linking it in with the bigger models. So that was just an introduction. Um, and I'm actually gonna stop talking for a while because I wanna let you guys play with your own climate model. Um, so I, there's a model called inroads, which uh, is a system dynamics model. Uh, it's very heavy on energy topics and, and sort of more engineering things, but it's got a lot of different options and it's quite interesting. So uh, hopefully a link has been sent to you or is yes. Uh, a link has been sent on WhatsApp, so hopefully you'll have this model now. Um, but the, the basic dashboard here is that you have these sliders that are, are policy sliders that you can slide back and forth. Uh, and they will change that these are your inputs to your model. Then you have two panels that can display a ton of different graphs. There's a, a button up here somewhere you can click to change the graphs. Uh, and, and so you can see what different outputs you have. Uh, yeah, to see what kind of world you're creating. There's also on each of these a little three dots um, next to that, which gives you additional settings. So there's kind of an easy bar, but then the advanced settings to, to look more into that. Uh, and, and so what we're going to do is break into groups of about three. Uh, I think I've got enough institutions for this. Uh, and then I'm going to give everybody some kind of institution that you're going to be representing. Uh, and then I want you to make a scenario that would be good for your for whoever you're representing. Uh, and the real trick here is really try to focus on just a few key policy options. So it, it's very tempting to just slide all of the bars in one direction, but really try to pick the most important ones and think through what are the, the core things that your group would be defending or fighting for in, in this, uh, yeah, in this negotiations. Um, yes, and, and explore the settings and everything. 
So someone will have to help me keeping time on this, um, but we'll try to do about 15 minutes of this. We'll go back to a little more presentation and then we'll have another activity at the end of, to kind of wrap things up, if that's okay with everyone. I know four hours, this will be a little bit lighter. Um, so if you can break up into groups of three and then somehow let me know a group of three and I'll come and give you your, your institution that you're representing. Yeah, and physically move around, get, get yourself comfortable. Sure, sure. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. You're you're one. Let's see. You're going to be the French Development Agency. Okay. AFD. <laughs> Do I have a group here? Uh, you are, you are Donald Trump's re-election campaign. <laughs> Do we have a group here? Yes. You are, okay, then you are a German coal mine owner. <laughs> <laughs> that big one with the the scary things. What's that? Yeah, that big one. <laughs> You're Greenpeace. Okay. Um, you're BlackRock, big financial investor. Uh, back here, the administration of Lula da Silva in Brazil. <laughs> uh, University of Paris. <laughs> the university. Yeah. You can interpret that to be whichever configuration of universities in Paris, because the names change every time I come here. But uh, <laughs> do you, um, the IMF? <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Are we missing a group in the middle? You're only two? Um, the EPOG Alumni Association. <laughs> Does everybody, one more? Um, the European Commission. These two don't have one? Yeah. Electricity de France, the French electri electricity company. And Dutch? And uh, total, total okay. energy, yeah. Okay. Scenario that's best for us, or scenario that's best for us and its chemicals? No, best for you. Okay, just best for you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you want to do one, Rudy? <laughs> yeah, especially after four hours of lecture. It's no. Yes. Yeah. 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 But at the very end, later. Yeah. 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 See, they look so dead when we came in here. <laughs> It's like, oh no, apparently they're sick and tired of climate change. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course.
I will let you go back to the groups before this is all over, so. So, uh, yeah, so I'll go ahead and keep moving on. Um, but uh, yeah, so we won't present anything yet, but hold on to that and we'll come back to, yeah, come back to that experience in a second. Um, but just to talk about the model that you were playing with a little bit. Uh, so this is a climate economy integrated assessment model. Uh, and as you've seen, there's a lot of things that are interconnected in there. Um, you're kind of very casually playing with like 10 or 20 different systems uh, that, that are completely separately modeled and then interconnected in different ways. Uh, and, and so I like to, and in this paper that the discussants will discuss, I, I refer to these models as science fiction models because what they're trying to do is tell a story of the world's technical, social, economic, and environmental development 100 years in the future, uh, which is really like some, yeah, some science fiction stuff of thinking what kind of technology will exist? How expensive will it be? What will the economic and productive relationships between humans be in the year 2100? Um, and so what you were doing in this, in this exercise was scenario design. So trying to say, what is one potential path from where we are to another place that we want to be? And thinking through what, what is the different story that we can tell of, okay, if we really have very high carbon taxes and growth isn't too high, and we, we do these five or six things, this can get us to a place that we want to be. Um, but as economists, as an economic student, yes, scenario design is, is very useful in one of our tools, but the real exciting thing is the model construction. So the actual world building, what are the relationships inside that model that make one thing connected to another thing? Um, so what are, what are the rules? How are the things related? What are the, uh, the intensities? Uh, how important are different things? I imagine there's some bars that you would pull one way or another and think, wow, I thought this would be more important, but it's not. Um, and, and so that's sort of where, yeah, we as economists can be useful in trying to build better models and to, to help sort of, uh, yeah, challenge and critique some of the models that currently exist. Um, yeah, so challenging the assumptions. Uh, and, and so that's sort of what I want to just present here for, for a little bit of my work is, I guess I didn't say, I'm a PhD student with uh, David Fache at UTC. Uh, yeah, and so what I'm trying to do is take one very specific assumption that is inside of these models and, and play with it and, and challenge it and see what happens if, if you have different ideas about that. So probably not a huge surprise, but I, I am interested in growth and economic growth and how it is, uh, how it is treated in these models. And so I know, I'm trying to challenge assumptions about growth. Uh, and the main question is, what is the relationship between decarbonization and growth? Is it a story in which decarbonization will hurt growth through a loss of productivity? As we build all these beautiful windmills, we lose out on the chance of having the beautiful gas plants. And so our productivity of the economy is lowered. Or is there going to be a boost through increased investment and increased demand, which is a more Keynesian story? Um, and I don't know, at least as an economist, it seems like either one is possible or both are possible and then you see which one is bigger. Uh, but the big question that I'm trying to address, at least in this, this first model in this first presentation is does it matter? Is the size of the energy transition big enough to actually affect the global economy? Because it's possible that, okay, maybe it makes a little growth, maybe it hurts growth a little bit, but like it's really what, two, 3% of global GDP, it's not such a big deal. Um, but that's what I wanted to find out. And when I started, I did not know. Oh, and there's, there's my beautiful president. Um, and so something you may have noticed in the, the inroads model that you were playing with is GDP per capita is entirely exogenous. Nothing you did would change GDP except for changing GDP itself. Um, which is kind of weird as economists, right? You think if you're going to like change carbon taxes, at least that would do something to GDP. Um, but oh, you can't read a damn thing. Um, but this is sort of the structure of the economic module in the, the inroads model. And here they have, um, I don't have it here either, but basically a starting GDP per capita assumption or change per year. And so you just pick a number and then it runs through the rest of the economic model and, and determines everything else. Um, and there's, it is the first thing, nothing affects GDP, it affects everything else. Um, and that's an assumption that that is a way you can build a model. 
Um, it's not a particularly detailed model of the economy, um, but it's a very detailed of other things once you've determined GDP. Um, and, and this is actually a very unusual assumption for climate economy models. Uh, the traditional assumption is the story that I very briefly said of lost productivity. Um, so this is something called abatement costs. Uh, and, and in basically, I don't want to say every, but actually I believe every climate economy model that was in the most recent IPCC report, um, every single one of them had a loss of GDP due to decarbonization. Um, and so this is the chart here on the side. You can see as it goes from green to red, that is how much warming you prevented. So the green scenarios are the good ones, the red ones are the bad ones. And then the percentage is how much GDP you lost in different decades. Um, so the further you, basically the more you do to stop climate change, the more GDP you're going to lose because of this lost productivity. Um, and, and we can kind of get into the details more later if we want to, but this is really a product of the way the models are constructed using equilibrium modeling. So if you assume that you start in a state of equilibrium, the only way to go is down um, as you have policy that, that shocks you out of your optimal state of equilibrium. And, and so really by definition from the choice of the model structure, GDP must be negatively affected uh, by any policy. There's some clever ways you can get around that by sort of having a baseline that itself is non-optimal, but that's, that's kind of newer stuff that they're starting to work on. And even so, you can only do so much. It's it, it sort of, this is still the primary story within, within these models. Um, but here we are at EPOG and, and we are, at least there, I imagine there are some Keynesians in the room. Um, and, and so there's this very, very different Keynesian story uh, that would say, okay, if we're actually going to have governments spend lots and lots of money and private businesses spend lots and lots of money to change the entire energy sector, that's going to cause a lot of additional demand, all of this extra investments. It's sort of the animal spirit story. Um, and, and so what I have here is a, uh, a chart that you can barely see from uh, Professor Palombo and Roma Tre where the dotted line is the actual GDP uh, each year of the United States economy. The green line is their estimate of the output gap. So looking at the unemployment rate and estimating how much higher GDP could have been if the unemployment rate was, I believe, 3.4%. So basically, if you filled that gap by employing almost everybody, how much more GDP would you have had? And then the red line is what would have happened if you had followed the green line for the entire span from like 1960. So if you'd had high demand for the entire run of the economy, uh, if you've been fully stimulated, what would the economy have looked like at the end? Uh, and the result is that it's like, what, 50% bigger it is just massively bigger. Uh, yeah. And so that's just a very different story uh, in terms of what this prolonged investment from energy transition could look like. Um, so, oh boy, yeah, we're going to have fun with the model part. Um, so the, yeah, so that, that is sort of my question. Is the potential growth caused by the energy transition relevant? Uh, is it big enough, if this Keynesian story is correct, to actually matter? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, then what do we do about it? How do we fix the models? How do we look at different ways that this can be put into these big climate economy models? Um, and so what I've done is built this very small system dynamics model, um, which I'll, I'll try to present later a little bit, um, just to sort of put some numbers on this, run it through a couple equations, and see what happens. Um, so I have the, yeah, kind of roughly, what is the intuition of the model? What, what is this, this beast that I have created? Um, so I'm trying to track the effects of decarbonizing investments as they flow through the economy. So I, I'm starting by saying there is some stock of investments that need to be made in the energy sector to decarbonize it. There's some number of windmills that we need to build. Um, and that is that runs across here to the emissions intensity of GDP. So as you make these investments, the total amount of uh, emissions will fall for each unit of GDP. So the economy gets cleaner as you make your energy transition investments. Uh, yeah, and that is the direct effect here. But there's also these indirect effects that run through GDP. Um, and so it's basically the two options. First, there's a negative abatement cost loop to say, okay, you have some loss of productivity and we can calibrate that based on the estimates from the other models and say, yes, okay, the windmills are less productive and you lose a little bit of GDP. 
Um, and then there's also this investment multiplier. So we say, okay, let's take some of the estimates from the, the post Keynesians and see what happens if you just run these numbers forward and say, we have this much more demand each year. Uh, and yeah, and see what happens. Um, and then, yeah, so that's sort of the basic model running this way. Uh, the one sort of important trick is moving back the other way that as there's a link in the model that as the GDP gets higher, the rate of energy investments goes higher as well because the richer society is now able to invest faster. Um, this is sort of a, a not so obvious, it's not so obvious that this is a true thing in the real world, but it's a thing that is in equilibrium models uh, where you're able to maximize over the period of the model that if you assume that your society will be much richer in the future, then that richer society can then more easily pay to deal with all these problems. Um, so I built that loop into here uh, to, to see what happens. Uh, and then the game to play with this is to, to try to show the flows as they go one way um, and then turn on and off these different links and see how important each of these assumptions are and, and sort of see what, what the different results are as you get into these different, these different uh, assumptions. Um, so this is the full model. Um, I don't think I'm gonna try to talk through the whole thing here but I would like to hang out after and get drinks if anyone's interested in it. Um, the one thing I would say is I built this at a summer camp. So there is a system dynamic summer school um, and we basically had one week to build a model. Um, so just to sort of say in terms of if you're still looking for thesis methods to use, I highly recommend system dynamics as something to look into. Um, as someone who really didn't like modeling before, it's been very visual, you have boxes, you have stocks and flows that are then connected with things that influence them. Um, and so I, I wish I had found this when I was in EPOG. Uh, would have been quite, it's quite a cool way to put down your ideas, put very simple equations, mostly multiplication and addition, um, and then sort of see how things can loop back on each other. Um, so again, I'll, I'll be around after and happy to talk about this, uh, but maybe just very sort of in short, you have the green loop at the top with the energy intensity, and so that is built into the model here. You then have the, the pink and the yellow loops down at the bottom, connecting with an investment multiplier and then abatement costs. And then this brown loop running backwards saying as the stock of the GDP gets higher, the rate of investments also gets higher. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's all I should say about that for now, except that uh, that this stuff is cool and it's new to me, but I, I'm very, very excited about it and would be happy if epoggers got involved in system dynamics. Um, so what are what are the results when you hit play and, and run this from 2020 to 2050? Uh, what what do you see? So maybe I guess one one good thing I didn't mention so clearly. Uh, the way that this is calibrated is that there's a stock of needed energy transition investments. Uh, it's set at $30 trillion. Uh, this was taken from an IEA report, which again, it's sort of a rough number, but it was a starting point. And the assumption is once you have made that stock of investments, once you've done all $30 trillion, the energy sector is decarbonized. Um, and so in that sense, it is saying that you hit this full decoupling of energy GDP of GDP from energy emissions by the end of, of 2050, um, which again, that's kind of a, a very strong assumption that I, I don't think is something we'll see in the real world, but it was very useful for the model to just see, okay, if you have this strong assumption, what, what happens? Um, so the, what, what are some of the results on this? Yes, the colors finally work. Um, so you have three lines on the graphs. Down in green here, so first this is the annual GDP. So what is just the GDP in the three, the three worlds? So at the bottom, you have the one with only the abatement costs. Um, so this is where you just have this, this relatively modestly small productivity loss um, due to switching technologies. Uh, yeah, and, and I, this was calibrated to be basically what was estimated by in the IPCC reports by all of the other equilibrium models. Um, then you have the pink line at the very top, which is when you only have the multiplier. Um, and so the, what's the scale? The economy is almost twice as big. Um, it's sort of a really massive scale of, of difference here if you have this sort of fully stimulated world economy for 30 years. Um, 
Then in the middle here, I have both the abatement and the multiplier where you turn them all on and you can barely see it, but it's just a little bit below the pink line. Um, and so that's basically just saying that the multiplier is much, much bigger as an effect than the, the abatement costs, um, which something I did not really expect when I started this. I thought the abatement costs were a little more serious. Um, but where it gets more interesting is what happens with the emissions. Um, so when you have annual greenhouse gas emissions, there's two different paths. In the, the high growth, lots of, lots of economic activity path, the emissions shoot out very quickly. They actually increase a little bit, even though we're decarbonizing, uh, but then they crash down and reach net zero actually around 2040, uh, a, quite a bit earlier because the economy has gotten so much richer that it is relatively much more easy for, for the people in this world to invest. Whereas when you only have the abatement, you take your time and it goes much more slowly uh, to then finally reach the yeah net zero. But the interesting thing on the edge here is what happens to the cumulative emissions. Um, and, and again, surprisingly to me, both of these paths end up with almost the exact same level of cumulative emissions. So whether you go a little bit fast or whether you go slow, if you have that very important link saying that as you get richer, you invest faster, you end up with, with about the same level of, of emissions and warming. Um, so you may ask, what happens if you take that assumption away and say, okay, now in this world, we add another line where as the economy gets richer, the people in the world do not invest any faster. Um, they, act, they literally invest $1 trillion a year. So you have 30 trillion, 30 years, you just spread it out equally over the same amount of time. Um, so your growth path is pretty similar. It's actually a little different because of the capacity utilization gap, um, but not, not significantly different here. What color is it even? Light blue right in the middle. Um, but the damning one is here with the annual greenhouse gas emissions uh, that because you're not investing faster and you have the high growth path, you have a much, much larger, uh, much, much longer time of high emissions. Um, so in the next model step, this actually does reach net zero, um, but at that point it's too late. And the, the cumulative emissions in the atmosphere is almost double what it is in the other model ones. Um, and so that's that's kind of a, a big deal. It's kind of a big difference. Very not a, yeah. Where you might say, okay, these three paths look pretty similar. Well, the the, the blue one on the edge is quite a different beast entirely from from these. Um, so just the the final thing that's kind of fun here is uh. So I I had a pretty pretty post Keynesian, uh, pretty ambitious output gap. Uh, set in the original model run. And so I want to say, okay, well, what if it's not really so high, but a little bit lower? Um, and so what you then get is these fun cycles in the GDP growth rate where the energy transition is big enough to get us to full demand. And then we have inflation, we come back down and then we come back up. And, and so you're sort of constantly hitting up against the capacity of the economy. Um, but surprisingly to me, uh, it doesn't actually change the emissions or the actual total level of GDP all that much. Um, so you, you, yeah, so you, you then sort of end up with, I guess over here, the dotted green line is your greenhouse gas and emissions uh, and the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere at the end here. So it is a little lower because growth is lower. You're sort of assuming more of a ceiling on growth, um, but qualitatively, it's still not, not great and not a great scenario. Um, so this was, this was sort of a, a, a little simple model as a part of a PhD thesis, um, but what were the conclusions? What was sort of, why did I do this and why is it useful for me to, to keep thinking about this? Um, and, and I think the, the sort of main conclusion is, yeah, these growth assumptions matter. Um, and, and really I didn't, I wasn't so confident about that when I started, um, but it, it does seem like if, if the standard Keynesian multipliers are even like half correct, um, then the levels of investments that the energy transition people are talking about are absolutely big enough to have massive aggregate demand effects. Um, and so that is that is something that, I don't know, us as Keynesians or ecologicals or Marxists or whatever we are around here, like should probably be thinking about and, and take into consideration. Um, and that where does this matter is especially in equilibrium frameworks, um, which consider future wealth. So I, I kind of gave this presentation a week ago and one of the questions was like, okay, yes, but does anyone really defend that as we get richer, we'll invest faster? Like, is that something people would argue? 
And whether or not they would defend that, I think the important thing is that by having a long-term optimization framework, that assumption is embedded. You are saying you are optimizing over this long period of time. And so if you're richer in the future, by definition in this framework, you can then have a, a lower cost of investment. Um, so it, it's not necessarily a behavioral function in that sense, but just a part of the modeling. Um, and so for me, it seems quite important to, yeah, to, to say that if, if you, if you as a, a student or as a researcher aren't 100% convinced that as our countries get richer, uh, we will invest faster, <laughs> then maybe this is sort of a, an important, then, then the scales here are important enough that, that it's something we should keep working on and, and try to figure out. Um, and then just the, the last conclusion, which is something I, I haven't gone anywhere with, but it's kind of very striking to me, is that for any ecological problem that is not climate change, uh, this is also a huge problem. Uh, because yes, in this model, you're getting out of the problem by decarbonizing. So you, you sort of have this balancing where one goes up and the other goes down of, of growth and the, the emissions intensity. But for something like biodiversity, there's no solution here. This, this model isn't helping you. Uh, the amount of growth isn't necessarily reducing the pressures on biodiversity or, or water use or land use, uh, all of these other ecological problems we have. Uh, and so it, it does point to sort of an important thing, uh, yeah, an important distinction in how we do the transition for what that means for, for non-climate change problems. Um, and yeah, that's I think there's a reason that a lot of the modeling community is starting to talk about biodiversity. It's kind of one of the big buzzwords uh, because it isn't solved by the questions we're asking the model and the questions we're asking the model could accidentally or inadvertently cause much bigger problems there. So that's sort of the last thing that I have there. Um, I will check the time real quick, but if, do I have like, I've got 30, oh great, 13, that's good. Um, so I'm going to take 15 minutes um, and send it back to, to you guys for, for one more activity. Um, so in, in the, the inroads model, you may have noticed under the simulation tab, there's another tab that says assumptions. And then under this assumptions tag, there's about 30 different uh, drop down menus with different assumptions. Uh, these are cool and, and, and somewhat fun to play with. I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, the inroads is a system dynamics model, and so it's actually much more flexible than a lot of uh, yeah than a lot of these equilibrium models would be. Again, they sort of in the structure of their model, they there's a lot of things they don't build, like GDP, completely exogenous. Um, but it's built in a way that if you had the code, you could very easily add in sort of a whole extra structure to explain that. So they have a lot of things pre-built to let you play with. Uh, to play with some of these assumptions and to see, okay, if you change these assumptions, how does that change the effectiveness of the different policies? So I have one more activity for you. Um, we're gonna go back into the same groups and I want your group to try to find two assumptions uh, that your group wants to challenge, two things with the model that you're not happy about. One thing from your institution, so what is something that, that you as the energy company or Greenpeace are not happy about? And then one uh, as you as yourselves, as economic students, one thing that just doesn't seem quite right. Um, and I think we're just going to do that for now. If you guys don't have a million questions for me at the end, then I, I wanted to make the groups come together and try to make deals with each other. Um, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Um, I, I guess just the last thing that I'll say is, there's the assumptions tab, but then there's also the advanced settings. So you can click the like dot, dot, dot setting. Um, and there's some parameters that are like limited. So the obvious one is GDP growth. It only goes down to 0.5%. You can't go under that. That's kind of the easy answer of like, wow, it'd be nice to go under that and see what happens. Um, but there's a lot of others that are kind of interesting. So if you find either these fixed parameters or the actual assumptions, um, and I'll do about 10 minutes and then we'll go over to the discussants. I'm going to take off my sweater. I'll just, yeah, I got warm. I see why they open the windows.
Yeah, then we go to the discussants. After, after the, 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 sorry, you, you take the barrel last time before like. No, I, I think we'll just do 10 minutes and then we'll go straight to them. I don't have anything else to say.
I think. Yeah, yeah. He's... Which is like the cold. Like you're not going to solve climate change by changing the assumptions in the model. <laughs> It's a beautiful growth rate. <laughs> Someone's been thank you. <laughs> okay. I think we're ready for the discussants to get started. I thought we were going to do that. we ready? Hello. Hello. Okay. Oh. Hello. Uh, Perfect timing. Five thirty one. Hello, everyone. So <laughs> if we if we have time at the end, we'll we'll come back and do some feedback on on what you came up with. Um, and I think we will have time, but now I'll hand it over to the discussants. Hello, everyone. I am Mohammed, and with Elvira and Kenton, we will present uh, J. Christopher paper, expanding the, ex expanding the possible the need for the heterodox economics in integrated climate economy modeling. Okay, so I will start by presenting the, the, the existing model that Elvira then is going to criticize, present its, its shortcomings and analyze it in a critical way. Then it's, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, Kenta will present an yeah. alternative and then we will finish with some questions and a discussion with the authors. So before uh, before we go into in, in, in integrated model, it's really important to understand what why do we use models? We don't use models to sound smart and sophisticated. We use models because they are useful. Uh, as Jean Bach said, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Mo model comes from modulus, which is Latin for law, and we don't mean here like the legal standard and police and that kind of stuff. We mean law, which is what characterizes things, what defines a phenomenon. And this is why you why you use models. We use models to understand the past and forecast the future. Mo there are basically generally two different models, quantitative and qualitative models. And quantitative models basically are the models that you get if the output is a numerical, is, is a number more or less, or a quantity. And most, most models in, most climate focused models are quantitative models in a sense that they do give, they do provide an increase say in temperature or in sea level rises, but also they are qualitative in the sense that they do help us design policy to mitigate climate change for our examples. Climate models have been used by the IPCC since the 1980s, and they have evolved through time to understand climate change and propose some policy alternatives. So this fa the family of models is encompassed by what we call IAMs or integrated assessment modeling. So as we know, climate change is a global phenomenon and it's a complicated phenomenon. It's not like 
the stock market or biology or something, a closed system. It is an open system that is affected by, by many different variables and the results of what occurs then changes those, those variables. So it's constantly evolving. And integrated assessment models try to take into account all of those variables and in a, in, a, in a dynamic manner. So we have a constant interaction between climate change causes and effects, which makes the modeling complex, but also useful at the same time. Then we use our models to perhaps to forecast and propose some policy solutions based on our forecast. There are generally two integrated assessment models. The first is a process models, which analyze a specific phenomena, let's say deforestation or the rise in sea level or greenhouse gases. So they are focused on a specific level. And then we have the benefit cost models, which they then analyze what will happen if we take this policy or this other policy. And they use the classical benefit cost models that uh, Jay Christopher spoke about, and they have all of those underlying assumptions about how the economy work. We have that. We have that some, for instance, very famous models that we have that are used are the RCP or or representative concentration pathways, and this and this basically they are used to 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 show the effect of a, of a concentration of CO2 of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then they measure that the effect of that concentration on the planet. The measure is called the radiative forcing ranges. And, and it, the range is 2.6 to 8.5 watts per meter square. And 2.6 is, is, is the scenario where, where we undertake the green transition fully. And 8.5 is business as usual. Now I will pass it to Elvira to present the rest. Hello, everyone. So just a quick quiz, like a really micro quiz, just one question. Um, might of you, some of you might have seen it probably somewhere in Europe. Uh, so uh, the question is, in which city can you find this images? And could you please raise your hand if you think that it's in Paris? I do not. That was very smart of me. Um, <laughs> master student, of course. Some of you who probably has a very bad sight over there, do you think it's Vienna? <laughs> okay. okay, let's summarize. You are also smart guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of course, it's Paris. It's Paris Gardenor, and actually, um, these images were, um, um, they were created in 2015 uh, for the COP21 here in Paris, and they were influenced by the theory of. Um, I'm sorry if I will hurt someone's feelings. Um, I'm not very good in um, surnames in Japanese. Shokuro Manaber, um, his theory in the 1960s, um, which was the actually the basis of the science on climate change and the idea of these uh, images of was to um, put the climate science closer to the public. So, um, as we all know, the climate change is a, um, on a crucial topic nowadays, and we should pay more attention to that. And maybe uh, this idea really take um, an effort to put uh, the science closer to the public, to the society, but at the same time, for example, I don't understand these equations, and I'm not sure that people in Paris um, and Garden are, uh, also understand them. So let's think about the integrated assessment models and whether they really make the climate change uh, and uh, climate science closer to people or not, and if it's really helpful to make the policies. What are the drawbacks for, for that? So, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mohamed. 
So, of course, let's uh, criticize here a bit uh, these models. Uh, one of the um, heavy criticism of IAMs is that they give really unrealistic assumptions about how climate change will um, affect the economy. And also, uh, they provide the a limited estimate of the economic damage of climate change. Um, also, at the same time, because there are different types of IMs, we have this double complexity problem. What I mean here, that like model can, like no model actually can adequately represent the complexity of the real world. But at the same time, any model that tries to um, become like tries to do that actually become very complex and potentially intransparent, and it. Um, actually the case of IEMs because from one side they actually put a very uh, vague understanding of the uh, um, such um, uh, complex thing as climate change but at the same time we are at risk of making them more and more uh, complex and are potentially intransparent um, but of course we are as the heterodox economists um, should um, take a look at the core of um, IMs and see there what are we going to see there, of course, neoclassical economics. Um, uh, the idea of um, basing these IMs on neoclassical economics actually will lead to the narrow understanding of the future based on the idea of growth. We are excluding the idea of the growth from um, the discussion at all here. And um, it will, of course, lead to the uh, too optimistic understanding of the future. Um, yeah, Mohammed, can you please? Um, I am very sorry. Yeah, we had also very, very light colors here. But basically, you you didn't lose anything. Um, <laughs> almost all of the all of the um, models of um, Northhaus uh, of William Northhaus, who is the Nobel uh, Prize winner, they are all all of them are based on the global uh, warming um, around like three three degrees. Like some of them are here, like it's like two point five. Some of them like three point four. But basically, as you see, we can see how he tried to change his opinion about the loss of GDP here. So in 1991, he started from 0.25% uh, um, of um, decrease in GDP. And in 2008, we can see that um, he was not that modest. So it was minus 2.60%. Uh, what we can see here is um, basically the um, the idea that um, climate change is something trivial. It's not so much of a sense and uh, it's not a big problem and the decrease in GDP is not um, a big deal uh, to the world. And also what is interesting here, an interesting fact about Nordhaus models, uh, he thought that, for example, indoors activities will not be influenced by um, um, global warming at all, also, as well as a lot of different industries. And uh, to summarize the impact of these industries, it's like 90% of uh, global GDP. It includes almost everything he said that it that it will not influence any of these industries. So, uh, Mohammed, could you please? <clears throat> so, after we um, paid our homage <laughs> to the classics. Um, okay, uh, please give me like five seconds. I will try to understand <laughs> what was here. Of course, so there was a map here. So, yeah. Um, um, so the main idea was uh, here to show you that, um, of course, uh, we all know because of a lot of plenty of ecological challenges we had and uh, joint seminars that um, Global South is very vulnerable 
to to climate change and actually it will be heavily influenced uh, in case of um, a decrease and for example we can see uh, in the models of nerve house uh, the um, uh, increase um, of temperatures by three percent for example if we take a look at rcp 8.5 the the projection they have uh, is that the increase um, of temperature by 2.6 to 4.8 degrees will lead to uh, 0 0.4 to um, 0 0.8 sea, um, meter sea level rise and of course we know that it's pretty a lot it's not like anything and um, um, most of the regions in global south will be influenced by that yeah um yeah as you see here on this map um so that actually leads us to the our next assumption oh gladly here it's much better so um we were thinking with the guys about the uh, underrepresentation of global south in IPCC reports, as we already said, um, um, Mohammed already also uh, talked about it. Um, IPCC reports um, are heavily based on um, IM's models, and we decided to take a look at the uh, contributors, uh, actually at the authors by countries uh, who actually um, write the IPCC report chapters, and we found out that, of course, most of them are from Global North. And yeah, I'm very sorry, guys. Uh, next time the colors would be much better, much brighter. But um, like, um, Africa is almost white, so no, no people are there. Um, yeah. So the most, and we are. We also calculated like percentage is like 70 something percent of our authors from Global North. Um, what's our point here is that if we want to include and try to make the our climate change a little bit less harsh on Global South, maybe we should include these people into the policy making and into the um, contributing to um, build this um, integrated assessment models. So now we talk about the political side, so don't fall asleep, please. Um, so as Ariel pointed out, the neoclassical integrated assessment models dominate up to the point of being used as the IPCC for its social economic parts. So I was, as Mohammed was talking about, the shared social economic pathways are quantified using classical AMS and they are the match with APCs. So basically, what we think, that, like, I was quite surprised because for me, I, I personally trust kind of the APCC, but not so much in neoclassical economics, but then for the social economic path, they're the same. So even, and the thing is, even if all of these models were based on reliable data and hypothesis, they would fall short of providing what the models should provide for. Can you? Oh, no, actually, no, no. <laughs> no, yeah. IMS should present, offer a vision for the future. And models that run until 2050, 100, they cannot be precise. They cannot predict anything. They are here to show realistic pathways so that we can maybe find a viable way towards a sustainable future. They are here to excite imagination to develop critical thinking, to envision what can be done, what must be done, and therefore what we want to do. And what's more is the predictions of the models can actually self-fulfill. So when they, when they lead for, to policy making career into the conclusion of the models, uh, for example, a collective of, art, of artists working on integrated, integrated assessment models that you can actually look up at this website. This is really cool. And they basically, one of the things they say is that scientific legitimacy can build up political legitimacy. And they give the example of the vegetarian diet that has been used in some IM, IMs, and which uh, for we, and then some countries actually implemented policies to favor a vegetarian diet. So political legitimacy was second. They didn't like 
used the hypothesis from the political debate, but they created the political debate. So the two contributions to heterodox economics, yeah, the image was cool. I <laughs> generated background, but uh, never, never mind. So first contribution of heterodox economics, contrary to neoclassical economics, they think of the world as a complex system. They can factor social equal, geopolitical, epidemiological considerations. For example, basically, there is no pandemics, no economic crisis, no social movements in neoclassical ec uh, economics uh, integrated assessment models. And with climate change, we already see this happening. So this is completely incoherent. And the second contribution is the changing of cost benefit optimization. Instead of trying to find the most cost efficient economic and climate pathway, should we maybe find the faster or the maybe the most risk adverse? This is a very important contribution, I feel, because it reintroduces political debate into the economics, IMS or assessment models. But assessment relies on the use of values and values should not be imposed on. They should be discussed democratically. So basically, IMS fall short of providing realistic and unbiased visions for the future, but they also narrow these visions down to the most uh, classical TNA. There is no alternative, but there is an alternative. And when I was reading the articles, it reminded me of something I felt was related. It's an online, it's an online game called Alpha Socialism. I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically you implement policies, you design, develop research, you adapt the production mix to achieve a sustainable future. And while playing, I was wondering how they managed to evaluate the impact of the different policies you try to choose. For example, you can choose to restrict air travel, develop marina protected areas. And then there was like the mix, the production mix. And the thing is, they use the simple climate model and then they estimated input values for many different production processes to create a rounded integrated assessment model that determines energy use. You can see all of these values, energy use, carbon emission, temperature rising, land use, water use, and so on. And I really recommend playing the game actually allows to do what you said in the article that we need to do expanding the scope of our futures. And on a side note, the game is based on a book called Alpha's, uh, Alpha Socialism. And you might wonder why Alpha Earth. Well, this, the book states that biodiversity loss, I think, or they call it the thick extinction, could actually be considered as the most important problem at hand. And the planetary boundaries framework asserts indeed that the biosphere integrity boundary has been triggered for a long time now, while the climate change is not yet completely done. So basically, they rely on a theory saying that half of the Earth should be remain untouched to present 80% of biodiversity. And I did this side note because I would like to ask you, do you have any ideas on how to factor this and other planetary boundaries into integrated assessment models? Because the planetary boundary framework allows all of these planetary boundaries or interdependent. So like maybe we can do some loops as you, you presented, but how can we show like the complexity of the problem and try to think about what could be possible? So this is a conclusion. <laughs> you want to present the question? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think everyone already read. So um, we have, of course, several questions to you. Um, what is the future of climate policy in light of the weaknesses we just presented? Uh, second question is, uh, since the current dominant models are um, criticized sometimes for using data extracted from the present or the past, how can you build reliable empirical models and uh, where would the data come from? 
the third question is hypothetically a similar storm uh, hitting a rich and the poor area would do more or less the same damage in human terms, probably more in the poor place, actually. And in economic terms, the damage would be much higher in the rich region. Does applying these models on a global scale a risk bias and mitigation policy in favor of wealthy regions? And the last one, how do you factor different planetary boundaries into IMS to acknowledge their interdependence? That's what Canton said previously. Thank you very much. Do I get to keep the questions in front of me? Yeah. Uh, one has the question. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I, I'm supposed to answer first. Uh, yeah. Can I sit here? Is that acceptable? Mm -hmm. And then someone else will pass it around. Oops. Maybe, maybe. Okay. So I think I want to start with a question you didn't ask, but you talked about a lot, which was the cost benefit models. Um, can people in the back see me enough? I can stand up as well. I don't, I'm up. Okay, that's good. No, uh, yeah. So the, the, the cost, we, you talked a lot about the cost benefit models. And there's something that's somewhat fascinating that's happened just in the last five or six years. So I, I was actually in Paris for EPOG when the Paris conference happened uh, back in 2015. So we saw the fancy people coming and going, the whole city shut down. It was quite a thing. Uh, they made protest illegal for a couple of weeks. That was, that was fun. Um, but but the, as you all know, the big thing that came out of that was that the international community now has a target that the goal is two degrees, maybe 1.5. Um, and, and okay, we see what happens on a political level, but on a scientific level, that was very important because it removed the question of how much climate change do we want. Um, and so if you think of the cost benefit models of all the Nordhaus stuff, the question he's answering is what is the optimal level of climate change? What is the level where the cost and the benefits meet each other? Uh, and his answers were originally like four and a half degrees, then four degrees. When he got the Nobel Prize in 2018, he said 3.5 degrees. Um, that was still what the model was saying was the optimal level of climate change. But now nobody cares because the goal is two degrees. Uh, and, and so from a modeling framework, we have moved from cost benefit to cost minimization. So the question is different. It is not how much warming should we have, but what is the most, the least cost way to get to two degrees or 1.5 degrees? Um, what is a cost? That is the golden question. What exactly, which cost are you minimizing? Um, is it literally the investment cost? Is it the lost GDP total? Is it a broader societal or ecological cost? But that is more or less the game uh, of now of how these IAMs have changed. So I, I guess I just wanted to pick up on that because it's, it's, it, it, it's a good thing that came out of the Paris Accords, I think, at least in terms of science is concerned, is that we don't have to keep fighting about whether or not we should be doing something about climate change, but we can start every paper with, as was decided in the Paris Climate Accords, we're shooting for two degrees. So my model is calibrated to two degrees. Like, okay, it makes that part much easier. So the questions of what is the future of climate policy? Uh, I think my answer would be that whatever the future of climate policy is, it probably doesn't have a lot to do with climate economics models um, because, yeah. I think that here, models, I think that's, as, as I said, uh, mo models are used to, under, to, pro to uh, propose uh, policies. And so since these models, as we, as we have seen, are tenuous at best, the policy also gar gar garbage in garbage out. The policy that they will propose also would be faulty. Yeah, but I, I guess my my bigger point was I think the policies the models have been proposing have not been adopted. So the models are incredibly clear that we need a very high universal carbon tax. Um, what we have been doing is everything else. We've been subsidizing things, doing industrial policy, having regional carbon taxes, having industrial or sectoral carbon taxes, um, having emissions trading schemes and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but we have not done what the models told us to do. Um, and, and so I, I, I guess I wanted to 
I, I am doing climate models. I think these are useful and important, but I think it's good to know why they're important. Um, and for me, it's to help policymakers do what they want to do anyways. Um, so I, I kind of always frame my activities of like, I know my current government in the United States right now probably isn't interested in any models I'm working on, but if a, a couple primary elections had gone the other way and Bernie Sanders was president, maybe they would be. Um, and, and we've seen some like shocking developments politically in a lot of places. So it's not so crazy. Uh, even just from our cohorts of EPOG people from five, six years back starting to get into positions and, and it happens. Um, and, and so that's sort of my, my understanding is less of thinking we're gonna make the best model and convince the policymakers, but that we're going to make models that are useful to the policymakers who can make good policies. Um, and so applying that to climate. So I, I think, yeah, that would kind of be my answer is that the direction of climate policy depends on politics um, and, and that that's sort of what's going to drive this. But then as technical economists, for those of us who stay in this world and want to be academics, our contribution is to help enable uh, yeah, the technical side wants those political forces do what they're going to do, um, or to go join the political forces and, and burn things in the streets. And that's, that's kind of another good thing a lot of us do. Um, and, and you can do both. Uh, not, yeah, it's not an either or, but, but you do kind of have to split your time. So uh, yeah, data on the present and the past. Um, hmm. But I think also here is really difficult to extrapolate from the past because the future in an era of climate change will be completely different than the past. And so that data would be uh, useless in that kind of environment. I would say on this, it, it depends what questions you're asking um, and, and how much certainty you need, right? Um, so I, I was at a conference recently with one of the authors of The Limits of Growth from what, 50 years, we were, yeah, 50 years ago, we were celebrating the anniversary. Uh, and he was kind of explaining when they made the limits to growth, they understood that their goal was to be within 30% of whatever the true variable, the numbers were. It was a 30% model. And, and so they weren't trying to project the population, but to be roughly in the right area. And I think if that's your goal, then yeah, you don't have, yeah, we have enough data to, to kind of go forward with that. Um, I feel like not enough data or not good enough data is never a reason to, to stop. Um, where I think it becomes very problematic is when you have massive ranges. Um, so you, you talked about the global south a little bit. I think this is a place where there's just a massive range of possibilities that are still open. Um, a, you, a place like Europe, there's a pretty clear path that should be followed if we meet the goals um, of we have these fossil fuel plants, we need to replace them with renewables, maybe some nuclear, maybe some carbon capture if that is, it turns out to exist. Um, and, and we kind of have to like make that transition happen. In the global south, it's like multiple things at once of sort of e development or not development or something else and different paths and like probably having much higher energy use, hopefully having much higher energy use. Uh, and then how is that provided? Is it originally by fossils and then a transition? Is it immediately by renewables? They're all possible. And so again, I think there's data you can draw on, but it might not be the exactly what you're looking at. Um, maybe a really concrete example. So one of the models that I'm working with uh, for the technical structure of the economy, so how the sectors are related from each other, literally what inputs you need to demand from, uh, you all do input output now, but what their, their A matrix is of what you need to demand from one sector to, to give you something out from the other sector. They say, we approximate in our, what they call a green growth scenario, um, that in our, our kind of best case, the technical structure of the world converges to the, tech, the current structure of Denmark. So we say, if you try to have the entire world in the most optimistic case, move to a, what they call a green growth society, that it ends up looking something like Denmark. Uh, is that gonna happen? No, of course not. But it, it, as an approximation, it, yeah. I mean, you can see how you could get there. And yeah, I think that that's, that's defendable. Um, this question, I have a slide for this, but I don't wanna upset the, the balance here. Um, yeah, this is a big problem. Um, so uh, there was a really interesting paper, um, oh, who's, is by the, the AFD guys. So, so yeah, but I think it was by Godin's team where they, uh, they were looking at what would happen if you took the data associated with the last ice age and ran it through the climate damages models. 
Um, so basically saying it was about a four degree change from uh, that was occurred in the last ice age. So let's just run it through the models and see what happens. Um, and there's a couple different models, so they have different results. Um, but one of the funny things was in which one? One of these, Africa ends up getting so much richer because the temperatures come down to a, an optimal level. Basically, the temperatures of Africa end up being the same, well, the parts of Africa end up being the same temperatures in California today. And so we assume that 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 sort of belt, I guess, no, it was the entire equatorial region, that's what it was, ends up approximating the temperature of, of California. And so we assume they'll become as rich as California. Uh, and that's where all the people in the world live. And so suddenly going to a new ice age, you have negative 100% GDP losses for all of North, like everything North of like, oh, I don't know, St. Louis uh, and all of Europe, it just, the economy collapses, but world GDP doubles uh, because the equatorial regions get so rich. Um, sort of a, a silly story, but just to say, yeah, you get some insane results if you just run things through models, especially if you're dealing with massive population imbalances or uh, massive wealth imbalances. Um, so you can say a hurricane hits an island, but the people there are poor, there's no damage. Uh, whereas like a bus runs off of its course in, in California, oh no, suddenly it's caused more damage than the hurricane because it ran into a glass building. Um, but but really that's that's why there's sort of, Again, coming back to my first comment, I'm very glad the cost benefit discussion is done because this was the problems we had when this was what you, this was the debate. Okay, like, well, how much does it matter? How much are the cost of climate change? Well, like we still calculate it. It's important for the model. It's important for the coherence of the world you're telling, but it's not helping you set the target. Um, final one, different planetary boundaries. Oh yeah, okay, here's the hard one. Um, so uh, I think this is, there, there, there's kind of two, an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is to run your climate model to achieve your climate goal and track what happens to other things. Um, so you say, okay, we're trying to meet two degrees. And to do that, we need to use this much land for windmills. We need this much water, this much lithium that implies this many mines. And then we see, okay, what does that imply for biodiversity? What does that imply for nitrogen use? and then see what the outputs are. Um, and then if the outputs are not something we like, we try to recalibrate the model, recalibrate, go back to the beginning and say, okay, we need a scenario that is less bad for some of these things. Um, that's kind of the, the easy way because you don't have to change the model itself. You don't change the world, but you just run different scenarios to try to find the things you're looking for, um, which is something that yes, fixes climate change, but also fixes the other problems, yeah. I don't think it would fix climate change. I don't think it would fix climate change because uh, some of the problems would uh, counter uh, react on climate change so that we would not attain the climate goal. But within the logic of the model, you would fix climate change, which, which I know is kind of like a silly distinction. But if, if I'm saying I have a model and the objective of the model is to hit two degrees, then I can run that model and say, okay, I've hit two degrees and then see what were the implications for all the other problems. And then separately, I can build on to that to say, okay, we used, um, oh, so one of the models said to meet the EU's renewable energy goals, you need roughly the size of Spain to be covered in solar panels uh, or equal to all of the urban area in Europe. That's sort of the size of how much land we need just for solar. So you can say, okay, that's a problem. And then either we adjust to the scenarios or we say, okay, that implies all the biodiversity is gone. Um, that's kind of the easy one. The harder one is changing the model itself. And this is what you're saying of building this in to say, okay, in the model, it should not be possible to cover like 90% of Europe in uh, solar panels. At some point, the model should kick back and say, no, 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 the model stops you from doing this and either GDP collapses or the climate collapses or like something will stop them. Um, and so then you're into the world of having to either put limits into what's possible in the model or to have multiple things that you're maximizing. And that's, that's hard. Um, so this is kind of my next, the thing I'm working on is the second step is to say, I want a world that does two things. It has lower energy use and higher employment. Um, 
two things and it's sort of very very stylized but i'm trying to look at different sectoral balances how can you have a different structure of the economy that lowers energy use and increases employment um, and in theory you could try to do this for all of these different boundaries and, and balls to juggle um, but you have to build entirely new models and structures for that and that's hard so no idea what our time is um 20 minutes left Let's do some questions. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know. Um, yes, yes. I'm Mathieu, I'm Mathieu from Epoch Plus France. <laughs> Uh, yes, on uh, on energy because uh, I'm also playing with the the coping with collapse model, and it, in within this model, that we never reached like the fossil fuel reserves uh, if, uh, in 2100. And I wanted to know if it's something spe specific for this model, or like in all the model, we never reached the fossil fuel reserves uh, by the end of the century. I don't understand. What do you like the the reserves of fossil fuel? If there is that we we there is model where we reach this limit if we have a growth path normal. Okay, so you're saying that in the model you never use all of the energy yeah. reserves. Yeah, And the other one is about biodiversity. Um, I'm also yeah, very interested into how to integrate biodiversity into uh, this kind of model. And the only kind of stuff I, I found is to to look at indicators, biodiversity indicators. For instance, we know that uh, land use uh, is affecting uh, uh, birds and uh, birds is a really good indicator in terms of trophic chain to know the, 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 the health of the, the, the ecosystem. But I'm wondering if we can kind of build a feedback loop uh, from biodiversity into economic, economic system. And if yes, what could be the like different ideas? And that's all, thank you. Yeah, I'd say at least, yeah, a bunch of questions. Um, thank you, Christopher. Also, thank you, Mohammed and Navira and Quentin. Um, much of just one thing I remember there was an ecologist here one day, and I asked him about this feedback, and he didn't know. <laughs> so, good luck uh, <laughs> on the answer. But um, uh, my question is on the, about the um, this, this, okay, in, in, when you put the multiplier in fact, uh, because of the fast transition, so that there's like, okay, it's you're pushing aggregate demand and this is increasing growth. And I'd like to know your opinion on this. Do you think um, policy in the future, probably in the next years, we try, we need to deal with um, some kind of policies to kill this excessive demand um, and how we think this would be designed? Like, um, Maybe there is a way of like, okay, you, you are doing the fast transition, but you don't want demand to be so high. So I don't know. I've always been thinking if you're going to reach the stage of, okay, now we fully control demand in the economy and this, uh, this demand is just too much. And if you ever thought about this in these scenarios and if you think there's policy, it's going to be policy for it. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Kalina from Epoch Plus. Um, so a question, maybe you mentioned this, but in your model, when you look at decarbonization and how it affects GDP and everything, do you also maybe look at some social aspects or some changes in like within country inequalities or between country inequalities or some, because we, we already mentioned that we can't really trace for biodiversity changes and the models can't really capture everything, but do you capture some parts of like social changes that would happen? Thanks. Uh, so my question is about um, the model. I feel there is an assumption in the model about uh, what the solution uh, or where the solution can come from. And it seems as though technology is the solution that will help with climate change, even though a lot of times perhaps good governance or things along those lines might be more appropriate solutions. And um, so is modeling that looks at technology in this way um, even the appropriate way to understand the role of the academic but also the economist um 
yeah and the second question i have is that a lot of the times these models make assumptions about what we know like um for instance if we say that okay the size of the, the like okay let's assume that the size of spain has been convert the, the that amount of land has been converted into solar panels we don't necessarily know what kind of problems that will lead to and that never is reflected on the model so um it feels as though these technological solutions seem as you said before science fiction so uh like is the, like these models are they um um are they real um yes uh, my name is uh, lucas also epoch plus um yes i i also wanted to ask on basically a bit similar to someone mentioned i think the demand uh, side of the whole of this um if there is also models that uh, look at the um effect that potential policies would have that uh, actively cut demand for like i don't know like forbidding flights and stuff like this but like on a larger scale just looking not only from the supply side um João Boava pass um just a curiosity you mentioned um, input output analysis but which models are using so sectoral difference um and what do you think is mo most interesting there also in this debate that you talked about in the global south of developing with different kinds of paths let's say and if you know someone that is working on that I'll try to stop and answer a bunch of these. <laughs> it's about 10. No, but it's good. It's good. Um, now we see if I can read my handwriting. Um, so the, the problem of never using all the reserves, um, just kind of try to go in order. Uh, no, so I, I guess I should say there's a, a large um, system dynamics IAM called Medias. Uh, that was built as a, a collaboration between post Keynesians and ecological economists uh, and a bunch of engineers and, and energy people. And so I, I kind of, I'm hoping that will be the thing I work with in my next second, like next chunk of the PhD. Uh, and it's one of these big, scary, messy IAMs. Um, but one of the biggest problems, like the biggest results of their model is that energy limits uh, drives massive economic crashes very quickly within the model runs. And, and so it's not literally running out of reserves, but it's having pressures from the in, from not being able to produce enough energy onto lower GDP growth, um, which then creates cycles that leads to lower and lower, lower GDP growth, um, which they published this in like 2019. And now like fairly quickly, we are having this energy crisis, which is affecting GDP growth. Um, so there's at least some, some plausibility there uh, in some yeah, in some senses. Uh, I, I think reserves is a very specific question because the way that's measured and modeled can either be very small or very huge. Um, like the entire crust of the earth is reserves in some sense, but like, so I, I, yeah. But but yes, at least in Medias, it is sort of the main result is uh, fossil fuel availability, driving energy limits. Um, for biodiversity, this is the thing everyone is talking about, but not necessarily publishing yet, um, of how do we put this into the models um, for all of these reasons. Like, it, it's very obvious how important it is, and it's very obvious how hard it is to do. Um, and so I know, um, was it Bank of France was just talking about this and wanting to have people working on this? It, it is sort of a very trendy thing just in the last 12 months. Um, I don't have, a, I, I, I wouldn't say I have any sort of insights into yeah how that's going to be done except that it's it's good that we're at least talking about it um both because biodiversity in itself is such a big deal but also because of this planetary boundaries question that if it's almost cartoonish if we just say we're just going to fix climate change but not worry about anything else because then that becomes a very easy technical task to fix like oh we just like build a million solar panels okay we're done but then like oh no where did we put them where did all the lithium come from oh no where'd all the birds go uh and so th that's kind of the the things you're if you want to be serious about this you got to put into the models um or not have models and just see what happens 
Ah, policies to kill demand. There, there are kind of two questions on this. So this is what the, the sort of step two after my little cute baby model um, is, is trying to understand, yeah, trying to see what are different scenarios that could manage this high demand path to say, okay, if we're going to do the transition and we're Keynesians, then we assume that there's going to be some unavoidable amount of demand that we're going to have to manage. And so what do we do with that? And the best case scenario would be to say, we take that as an opportunity to reduce the, the demand levels in the most energy intensive or most carbon intensive sectors while increasing it in the least uh, carbon intensive sectors or the most socially advantageous, however we want to define that. Um, how you actually, yeah, how you do that policy-wise is kind of another discussion. But even just like in, like differentiated interest rates by sectors, that's kind of like the very simple answer. Um, going all the way to like very activist uh, industrial policy, depending on what context you're in. But it's it's not impossible, and it's not even so unprecedented to think of. Okay, we're just going to have like harder harder interest rates for heavy industry, um, and then hire a lot of teachers. Um, sort of as a very crude approximation. Um, and because we have all this stimulus from, from the investment, like the overall level of employment should stay high enough that we don't have a revolution, uh, even though we're cutting some of the heavy industry. Um, so that that's kind of, if anyone who wants to hang out after, I have, that's kind of the next model that I'm building, which is this input output model to say, you've got 35 sectors, they have these different intensities for both labor use and energy use. What are the different, rates of growth or degrowth that you can give them that give you higher employment and lower energy use um, and are somewhat feasible, um, at least that you can, that within the system it's coherent. So that's kind of where we're going with that. Um, for the social aspects, yeah, so I, in the small model that I presented, there's very intentionally almost nothing in the model itself. So there's no social aspects, there's no countries, there's no inequality, because I was just trying to answer this question of, are the growth effects big enough to matter? Um, and for myself, I've at least convincingly answered that with a yes. Um, and now that's letting me go work on other things. And so now I'm trying to look at sectoral things. Um, again, on that, there's there's not a lot of inequality on there, but, but it's very intentional of kind of keeping the questions uh, small enough that they can be answered by small models because I'm a PhD student and I can only do small things. Um, in the larger IAMs where you have big teams, yes, those that absolutely has to be something in there. Um, and then again, like with the planetary bound boundaries, it's a question of, is this something that we're tracking as an output of the model or is it a core feedback within the model that determines the behavior of the system? Um, so with inequality, you could say there is a level of inequality above which it starts to hurt growth and then loop that in. And then you can say, okay, there's also a tipping point. Once you get too far, you start to have social revolutions and then that changes everything. And like, if you want, you can build that into your model um, and, and that's cool. And right now I would say most models are in the first camp of just tracking what happens and saying, oh, the, the Middle East has a very bad three decades and everyone else is okay um, because you have regional inequalities, all right. Um, but you can do much more interesting things. Um, where solution comes from technology, uh, technological solution? Yeah, I, I think kind of two parts of the answer. First, again, as a PhD student, I'm trying to engage with the literature as I find it. Um, and the liter And so there's a lot of things that I take as a starting point that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, so even sort of the assumptions about growth or saying we need government directed investment, like, okay, if I was in charge of the people's commissars of the world, like maybe I would do this differently. Um, but, but I'm sort of very directly trying to recreate things that I find in the literature. Um, but, but even in terms of the bigger answer, I, I do think at a certain level, this, there is a core question of technology in this problem. Um, there are other problems attached to it as well, but but I think that it's it is good not to lose sight of the fact that there are giant machines that create carbon emissions that must be replaced with machines that don't create carbon emissions, um, and then those machines are embedded in a social and economic context, and that's kind of our job to then take over and and see what is the process of changing those machines, um, and, and so like 
I don't know, I'm not like a techno optimist or anything, but like at the end of the day, I do think we need to build some windmills and solar panels, um, even if we go into like full degrowth happy mode, like the the kind of this energy transition thing has to happen at some point. Um, and so everything else is also important, but but it is kind of the context around which this, this technological transition has to take place. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Um, and what problems will it lead to? Yeah, yeah, lots of problems. And, and that's sort of the, <laughs> lots of problems, but again, it, it could also lead to a lot of good things. And I think this is where there's sort of some, some hopefulness almost. I, I sort of said, especially with the developing world, that there's this question of how much bigger the possibilities are. And, and I think this is where there is this hope that some countries can jump over coal and jump straight to renewables because renewables have gotten cheaper than coal. Um, we're right in that gray area. We don't know what's going to happen. But if that did happen, it would be very cool. Um, and if renewables actually just keep dropping like crazy, you could have a world in which energy availability can take off very quickly um, in the developing world. And, and that could be very useful um, and, and a good thing for the world. Um, it would also mean a lot of lithium mines, which would kill a lot of birds. And so that's why it's it's hard for Chile. And then you have to kind of figure out the, the yeah, how do you put all that together? But at least, I don't know, there's a lot of doom and gloom, but it doesn't all have to be doom and gloom. And, and it's kind of good to see where some of the positives could be in this. Um, last two, demand cutting. Yeah, yeah, so I, I kind of already talked about this, but um, I don't know. I You'll notice I didn't use the degrowth word here, but. I mean, I'm kind of dancing around it, right? That That is sort of the question of if you have this higher demand and this demand causes problems, what do you do about it? Um, and, and so I think that is that is sort of a task of, if we take Keynesianism seriously on one side and we think we're going to have this demand and then take the ecological thing seriously on the other side and realize that we have to like not have some of this demand, then trying to think both what are the, I, the ideal endpoints to arrive to. What are we? What are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? And then, what are the policy levers? Um, is it industrial policy? Is it interest rates? Is it something technocratic? Is it like, yeah, how to reserve armies of of uh, of people in civilian conservation corps? Like, I don't know. We'll figure it out, I guess. Um, and then the very last one: sectoral differences. Yeah. So input output is a, a bigger thing now, especially with more heterodoxy people getting involved in this. Um, so the Medias model that I mentioned it has an input output core, um, and yeah, and, and that's 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 good and interesting. I believe the AFD guys are now working on putting input output into all kinds of stuff. Um, that's another thing that's quite new to me, but it seems quite useful, um, quite useful and quite empirical, which is nice. That's always nice when like those two things can be the same. So, but that's yeah another conversation. I believe we have four minutes. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so basically, the multiplier relies. I like part of the multiplier relies on the fact that uh, we are getting richer. But I think that even with uh, an increase in GDP we could say that we're not getting richer if we define wealth to include natural capital, but also negative wealth, such as coal plants, ruins, polluted landscapes, waste, so that we're not, maybe we're getting a bit richer, but also there is a lot of things that we will have to spend money and time on to treat. And like, we have to do something about these. We cannot let leave... Uh, like nuclear plants, coal plants, we have to, to do something about it. And so it will take a lot of money. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think you've caught me being loose in my language um, with rich in GDP. So the investment multiplier does not mean we're getting richer, but that GDP is going up as you invest more. Um, and what that means for well-being is a totally different question. But 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 the GDP part is serious for the environmental effects, regardless of the effects on well-being. And so that's sort of the thing that no, I'm trying to bring. The, the thing is, it's not about well-being, but it's about you, you said that it was the cost of the transition would be s smaller because we would have a bigger GDP. Basically, the idea of GDP, like 
it's not about well-being it's about material means but what i'm saying is that with a lot of things that we will have to deal with we might have more money and but we'll have we won't have more means because we'll have a lot of things to deal with more things more shit to deal with yeah yeah i would agree yeah. okay i do have a question just a quick question about about the capacity utilization mm -hmm. when you uh so i just want, want to know why is is it fixed in in your model because in one of the graphs it, it was fixed the graph where you showed where is the capacity utilization and then we have high inflation we have the recession and then it goes back but i realize that it's the same do you have any idea why is that I, if I understood the question, so in the the very in the small model, mm -hmm. I have originally capacity utilization is set at eight percent, uh, which means that the maximum rate the world economy could grow in any given year is eight percent, and so then the gap between the current GDP and eight is taken as the the gap of of how much is missing, and so then when I set it at eight percent, the energy transition is never big enough to get us to eight percent growth. Um, and so it doesn't matter. In the, the one with the pretty ups and downs, I then set it to 4% to say the fastest the world economy could possibly grow is 4%. Um, and then it gets to a point where the energy transition is big enough to hit us to 4%, which then knocks us down for the next year, and then it goes back up. Um, and so it kind of, that's sort of the, the dynamic there. Okay. It goes in terms of, in terms of, in terms of GDP, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. GDP percentage growth. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and uh, what what if we uh, replace the the increase in GDP by the the changes in CO two emissions? Um, I don't know. I don't understand. Like we could, we could assume that any growth done without CO two emissions is good so we can forget about it and focus only on the growth that is that result in CO2 emissions yeah okay that's a much bigger model <laughs> um so at that point you need a two-sector model at least of a, a a green and a brown um of sort of emitting and not emitting and then have to track different types of investments which you can do but again that wasn't my question um and, and so I, I i didn't i didn't have to do that but in a sense, that's what I'm trying to do with the, the input output is to say there's 35 sectors that all emit at different levels. Um, and then we try to deal with each of them individually based on how, how dirty or clean they are. Okay. Thank you very much. Ah, I think I'm one minute over. So. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.